Today we're extending our previous discussion of planar holography to the case of volume holography. So to get a sense for what we mean by volume holography, let's first imagine we have a planar hologram here in the plane z is equal to zero and it is some sinusoidal diffraction grading. We'll call this T0. And let's let T0 of X and Y be one plus M e to the I two pi U G X for M is much, much less than one. We'll call this the modulation index. Now, if it was really a sinusoidal, of course, we'd have this complex exponential plus its conjugate to get a, a cosine, say. But let's just focus on this term here. All right, so if we have then an incident plane wave coming in here, with a spatial frequency, say, in the x direction of ui, then we know that we're going to get a diffracted plane wave that will come off from this diffraction grating with a spatial frequency ud, where u diffracted is equal to u incidence plus u grating. And if we assume this is a, the incident uh, field is a plane wave with wavelength lambda, well, the diffracted field will also be a plane wave with wavelength lambda, and therefore the z component of the spatial frequency, wd, will be square root of 1 over lambda minus ud squared. Right, so this is the case where we're just looking at things in two dimensions, just the x and z coordinates, we're assuming there's no variation in y for now, we'll generalize things later on. So that would just be a planar diffraction grating, right? When a diffraction grating is a hologram of a plane wave. Now, uh, notice that for any incident plane wave, we will get a diffraction grating, and if we change the angle of the incident plane wave, the angle of the diffracted plane wave will change likewise. Now let's add another diffraction grating over here, say in the plane delta z. And this also has the same spatial frequency, but it might be offset in phase, shifted up or down. And let's call this t1. And let's suppose that t1 of x and y is equal to 1 plus m e to the i 2 pi u g x plus w g delta z. Okay, so w g delta z, by arbitrary choice of w g, we can make this an arbitrary phase offset relative to the first uh, planar diffraction grating. And because UG and WG are spatial frequencies of a diffraction grating and not a plane wave, there are no constraints on UG and WG. They don't have to have the sum of their squares be equal to 1 over the wavelength squared. So if we write that our incident field, gi of x, y, and z is equal to e to the i 2 pi u incident x plus w incident 
z, where for this to be a plane wave with wavelength lambda, we must have u incident squared plus w incident squared is one over lambda squared. Then at z is equal to zero plus, right after this first diffraction grading, what will the field be? Well, it will be this incident field times this transmit uh, transmittance function. So it will be e to the i 2 pi. Um, and let's, of course, we'll be at z is equal to 0. So the z, z terms will just be 0. So it'll just be ui x times 1 plus m. Now here, the t0, we'll pl plug it in e to the i 2 pi ugx. And so that will be equal to, we'll just get two terms when we multiply this out. We'll get the incident field, e to the i 2 pi uix plus m times e to the i 2 pi. Uh, we'll have ui plus ug. And of course, that, because we defined ui plus ug to be equal to ud, that will be the incident field e to the i 2 pi ui x plus m e to the i 2 pi u d x. So right after the first transmittance function, right, this is just what we sketched out of here, we'll have the incident field and then this small diffractive field, small because it's multiplied by this modulation index, which is much smaller than one. Now what we want to see, so that's, that's the result just for a single planar diffraction grading. What happens now if we have this second diffraction grading over a distance delta z away? Well, let's see. We're, we expect then this incident field, which in our approximation um, is essentially uh, undiminished, will also create another diffracted field from that diffraction grading. And that'll create another diffracted field that should Therefore, go off such that, assuming that the T1, which we've illustrated here, has the same uh, X component of spatial frequency, then these two diffracted field components will go off with the same spatial frequencies in X, and hence the same angle with respect to the Z axis. They'll be the same plane wave, but they could have a different phase, overall constant phase shift between them. And that phase shift could cause them to add up constructively or destructively. Of course, if it adds up destructively, they could cancel out and we could get no diffracted field. So we could get the situation that, whereas with a single diffraction grating, if we illuminate it by some plane wave, we'll always get a diffracted plane wave. When we have two closely spaced diffraction gratings with the same grating frequency, it's possible that even though each individual diffraction grating will produce a diffracted field, the total effect, the sum of those two diffracted fields might be zero. So the whole structure may not produce any diffracted field. And we'll see this is an example, this ability to either produce or not produce a diffracted field is related to something we'll call Bragg matching. It's so-called Bragg condition for diffraction. When you have a series of planar holograms, which will later generalize to a completely continuous volume hologram, a diffraction grating may or may not produce a diffracted field, and it will only produce a diffracted field under the so-called Bragg matching conditions. So we'll develop that here. So let's continue on with this now. And um, on the next board, we're going to see what happens when we take this field and we propagate it over to right before the second transmittance function and then multiply by that transmittance function and now we get our two diffracted fields.
Okay, here's our z-axis. And here is in the plane z is equal to 0, our first diffraction grading. And here is in the plane z is equal to delta z, our second diffraction grading. So, as we said, we're going to have an incident field, spatial frequency UI, and we will get diffracted fields with spatial frequency UD from these two diffraction gratings. And we already worked out that at Z is equal to zero plus, immediately after this first diffraction grading, the field was E to the I, two pi, ui x plus m e to the i 2 pi ud x where ud is ui plus ug and ug is the spatial frequency of the grading so now we want to propagate that to z is equal to delta z minus right over here just before the second grading so all we need to do to propagate a plane wave is to add in the z dependence so we would get e to the i 2 pi ui x plus wi delta z plus m e to the i 2 pi ud plus WD, oops, sorry, UDX, plus WD, delta Z, where WI is the square root, 1 over lambda squared, minus UI squared, and WD is the square root, 1 over lambda squared, minus UD squared. So then, at Z is equal to delta Z plus, immediately after the second transmittance, right, this was transmittance T0, and this was transmittance T1, what do we do? We take this expression and we multiply it by the transmittance function T1, which was, from the previous board, 1 plus M, e to the i, 2 pi, u g x, plus w g delta z. All right, so we multiply those out to get the field immediately after the second transmittance. Now, in doing so, we're going to neglect any term that has a factor of m squared. So this term times that term. And what would that represent? That would represent the scattering of this plane wave by this grating. So that would be called a second order diffraction, um, multiple diffraction. And since we assume that uh, m is very small, m squared is, is going to be negligible. So we neglect that. So what do we get then? Let's see. So we're going to get then 1 times the incident field. So we'll still get the incident field, e to the i, 2 pi, ui x plus wi delta z. And then we'll get 1 times this diffracted field. So that's this diffracted field here, passing through this diffraction grading. So that'd be plus m, e to the i, 2 pi, udx plus wd delta z and then we'll get one more term we'll get this times that All right so in general there'd be four terms but the fourth term will have an m squared we neglect that so we'll get this term times that term what will that get us so so it's m times well here we'll have a ui x and then plus because we multiply these plus ug x but ui plus ug is ud so this will be m e to the i 2 pi, 
u dx from these x components. And then we'll also have e to the i 2 pi, w i delta z, and w g delta z. And so that'll give us plus w i plus w g all times delta z. Okay, so now we got three terms, and that represents here the blue line, which represents the, the pointing vector, the power flow for the incident plane wave, and then these two diffracted fields, which have the same, uh, travel at the same angle because they have the same spatial frequency, u sub d. So let's rearrange this a little bit. We'll have the incident field, e to the i, 2 pi, ui x plus wi delta z, Plus, uh, we got two terms with an m, so we'll look right here, m times something. Well, I want to have, I want to factor out this e to the i, 2 pi u dx plus w d delta z. So I'll have m times 1 times that. And then I want to also factor out the same factor from this term. Well, that then will require me to write this as 1 plus e to the i 2 pi wi plus wg minus wd times delta z. And then that would all be times this factor right here. e to the i 2 pi u dx plus wd delta z. So let's verify that. <clears throat> so certainly the first term here, m times 1 times this, is just that term there. Now m times this times that, let's see, so we'll have uh, u dx, yeah, w d delta z, and then here we got a minus w d delta z, so those will cancel, and then that'll just leave w i plus w g delta z, so that indeed does work out. So this here is the incident, and that is the total diffracted field. Total, because it's the sum of these two diffracted plane waves. And the sum ends up causing it to have an amplitude m times this factor right here. Right? This thing it doesn't depend on x or y, it's just a complex constant. So then, to propagate that field further along the z-axis, so for some z greater than delta z, we use the fact that if we have a factor e to the i 2 pi wi delta z, and we want to then propagate out to a plane uh, for some value of z, so we'll, that'll be propagating a distance z minus delta z, that would add in a factor e to the i 2 pi wi z minus delta z and of course when you multiply those out the delta z terms cancel and you just get e to the i 2 pi w i z so using that idea our total field after we get past the second transmittance function will be g of x y and z is equal to the incident field g i of x y and z plus the total diffracted field gd of x, y, and z, where g incident is e to the i 2 pi ui x plus wi z using this factor up there. That, that, that fact, really, I guess. Uh, and the diffracted field, GD of X, Y, and Z, will be equal to M times this complex constant 1 plus E to the I 2 pi WI plus WG minus WD times delta Z.
times the spatially varying part, e to the i 2 pi, u d x plus w d z. And for that, again, using this, this fact up here with w sub d instead of w sub i. So that's the diffracted field. Now, this factor in brackets, what can that, what values can that take on? Well, what, what magnitudes can that take on? Well, let's see. E to the i phi, where phi is some uh, phase, uh, has a magnitude of 1. But since we're adding it to 1, well, e to the i phi can be equal to 1 if phi is equal to 0 or 2 pi or 4 pi, etc. So this could be 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. That's the largest magnitude it could have. But e to the i phi could be equal to minus 1 if phi is equal to pi or 3 pi or 5 pi, etc. So that could then give us 1 minus 1 is 0. So the magnitude of this expression has a maximum of 2 and a minimum of 0. So in magnitude, this can be anything between 0 and 2 by the choice of, well, what do we have at our disposal? Well, Wg, this uh, z component of the uh, spatial frequency of the grating, the diffraction grating, which represents the phase change between the two planar holograms. By choosing that appropriately, we can make this be plus one, so we get a total magnitude of two, or we can make it be minus one, so we get a total magnitude of zero, or any magnitude in between. So this is a function of Wg. Which, and remember what the effect of that Wg is, if this was our first grading, the second grading, the Wg, then would just cause a phase shift, means it would just cause this sinusoidal pattern to move up or down. And so by changing that relative position of those two sinusoidal patterns, we could cause the two diffracted plane waves to create a total diffracted field that is zero or two times m times that this plane wave or anything in between as far as magnitude. So now what we want to do, extend this idea to n gratings, each space to delta z part. And then extend that to a continuous volume grading and that will then put us into the realm of volume holograms so now let's look at a situation where we have diffraction gratings every delta z along the z-axis This is at zero, this is at delta z, this is at two delta z, three delta z, four delta z, five delta z, and so on. And each of these has the same x spatial frequency, but they might be shifted up or down along the x axis. And we're going to use for our modulation index m times delta z. Now, why would that make sense? Well, so this is delta z is the distance between these planes. And so delta z would be proportional to the volume in between the two planes. And we're going to then go to the continuous limit where we let delta z go to zero. It becomes dz, so m dz becomes the modulation index. So each of these planes, these planar holograms, 
uh, shrinks to zero, but then there are an infinite number of them. So that's the, the continuous limit. And uh, let's suppose that the entire length of this structure along the z-axis is L. And so L would be n minus 1 delta z, where n is the total number of these planar holograms. And in fact, then solving for n from this, n would be equal to L over delta z minus 1. So what are we going to get for z greater than L? We know just extending the idea that we had in our previous analysis, we're going to have an incident field plane wave come in, and it's going to diffract from each one of these gratings. We are neglecting multiple diffractions, so this, this diffracted field could also diffract on the next and subsequent gratings, but we ne neglect that because that would be on the order of m squared. So what we're really interested in then is out here, pat, after we get to the right of all of these diffraction gratings, what is the total field of all these diffracted plane waves added up together, the total diffracted field? So this is just an extension of what we did with the, the two planar holograms. And what we're going to get is it's a straightforward extension. We're going to get the initial incident field, e to the i 2 pi ui x plus wi z plus the modulation index m delta z. And before we got 1 plus an exponential factor, that's going to generalize to this sum n equals 0 to n minus 1, e to the i 2 pi wi plus wg minus wd times n delta z, and then the diffracted plane wave e to the i 2 pi udx plus wd z. So for n is equal to 0, this is just e to the 0, that's 1. And then for n equals 1, it's what we had on the previous board, e to the i 2 pi wi plus wg minus wd delta z. But then for n equals 2, it's the result we would get when a grading is at a plane z is equal to 2 delta z. So the delta z would be replaced just by 2 delta z. And then for 3 delta z, replace it by 3 delta z, etc. So just the exact same analysis we did before. Now, with the, uh, with the various diffraction gratings in planes delta z, 2 delta z, etc., all the way up to n minus 1 delta z. So that's what we get. And now what we're going to do is go to the continuous limit. We're going to let delta z go to 0. Uh, n delta z here, we're going to call just z, right? Because that's just how far you are along the z-axis. Here at 2 delta z, we're 2 delta z along the z-axis. So obviously, since delta z is going to go to 0, uh, n is going to go to infinity. So these this product will stay the same. It'll be whatever this plane is. But little n will get bigger and bigger. Delta z will get smaller and smaller. And of course, the, then the number of planes goes to infinity as delta z goes to zero. So we go to a, the continuous limit. And in that limit, this expression here becomes m. We're going to have the integral from zero to l of this expression here, e to the i 2 pi wi plus wg minus w, d, n delta z, that's just the z coordinate, z, and then delta z, that's going to zero, that becomes a differential dz. And so that's what that factor becomes. And this can be evaluated. It is m times e to the i pi, not 2 pi, wi, plus wg 
minus W D L times L sink L W I plus W G minus uh, W D. So that's a phase term and an amplitude term. And of course the sink is only uh, significant near where its argument is equal to zero. So that means that we're gonna get strong diffraction only when we have approximately WI plus WG minus WD is equal to zero. So let's continue looking at that and see what the significance of that is. This is just an extension of the idea of these, what we had on the previous board, these two diffracted plane waves adding up uh, either destructively or constructively. And now we've got n of those adding destructively or constructively and then continuing passing on over to the continuous limit uh, where this is the destructive or constructive interference is summed up by this amplitude here, this sink amplitude. So let's look at that factor L sink L WI plus WG. So the incident Z component of spatial frequency, the grading spatial frequency component along the Z axis minus the diffracted field spatial frequency component along the Z axis. What does that look like? So here is WI plus WG minus WD. Here's zero. And this is a sink function. The peak will be, well, the, the sink of zero is one, so the peak here will be L. And the first zero is when this is equal to one, so that means that this sum of these Ws is one over L. And then we also have a zero at minus one over L. So that's what that sink term looks like. And as we let L go to infinity, this goes to infinity in amplitude and zero in width, um, which becomes a delta function. Wi plus Wg plus W. D. And therefore, we only get a diffracted field if we have what we call the Bragg condition. Which is that WD of the diffracted field is equal to WI of the incident field plus WG of the grading. And we already know that UD we define to be UI plus UG. And so we can easily generalize this now. We've been assuming there's no Y dependence just to make the math two-dimensional and easier. But now we can look in general. We'll have an incident field, GI of X, Y, and Z, which is E to the I, two pi, UI X plus VI Y, plus W, I, Z, which we're going to write as e to the i, two pi vector u, i, dot vector x, where vector u, i has components u, i, v, i, and w, i, we call this a wave vector because it gives the spatial frequency components of a plane wave. And uh, x vector is just the position vector x, y, and z. And for this to be a plane wave with wavelength lambda, well, then we need to have that the norm or magnitude of this vector, this wave vector, must be. 1 over lambda, which is just a statement 
the square root of ui squared plus wi squared, I'm sorry, plus vi squared plus wi squared, square root of that is equal to one over lambda. So this is indeed a plane wave with a wavelength of lambda. And likewise, let's define a wave vector for the diffracted field, vector UD, which has components scalar UD, VD, and WD, and which, since it's a plane wave with wavelength lambda, satisfies vector UD norm or magnitude, which is the square root UD squared plus VD squared plus WD squared is equal to 1 over lambda. And so that's also a wave vector. And now for the grading, let's define UG vector, which has components UG, VG, and WG. Now this is not the a wave vector. It is not the spatial frequencies of a plane wave. Rather, it, it represents the spatial frequencies of a grating, which in general could be have any spatial frequency. So there are no constraints. on vector ug, or we'll call our grading vector. And now, in general, ud will be equal to ui plus ug. And in scalar components, that is, in the x along the x uh, axis that's scalar ud is ui plus ug we already defined that in the y direction we have likewise vd is vi plus vg and then in the z direction we have what we described as the bragg condition wd is wi plus wg So from each of the planar diffraction gratings, we would get a diffracted plane wave, which would have these x and y spatial frequencies. But then all those n diffracted plane waves would only add up in phase, constructively interfere, if we also had this Bragg condition. So if this is not true, then we, all of those n, which goes to infinity, number of plane waves add up destructively and the net result is no total diffracted field. Now there's an interesting interpretation of this equation right there which contains the Bragg condition. So let's draw here, let this be say the W spatial frequency and up here U and then say kind of out of the board we'd have the V. And then imagine this is a sphere. Obviously, I'm just drawing a cross section, a circle, but it would be a sphere centered at the origin with a radius of 1 over lambda. And that's the condition that the if we put the base of these wave vectors at the origin, then their tips or points have to fall on this circle. So suppose this is our U incident. And then we have, oops, we have a grading vector here. UG, and they sum up to get us diffracted wave vector UD. So this is a picture of this condition. And 
we know that the, the wave vector for the incident and diffracted fields have to fall on this sphere of radius 1 over lambda, and they have to be connected by this grading vector, ug. So what does the Bragg condition mean? It just means this geometrical picture. And if it was, if we had something which did not satisfy the Bragg condition, well, it could look like the following. Here's U, B, and W. Here's our sphere. of radius 1 over lambda. And suppose here is our U incident. And now suppose our U grading was something like this. Well, if UD is UI plus UG, That would have to be then the wave vector of the diffracted field. But that does not fall on the sphere of radius 1 over lambda. In other words, and so that does not correspond to a valid plane wave. For this wavelength. Now it would correspond to a, a plane wave for some other wavelength, in this case a longer wavelength, a smaller radius, right? but the field has only a certain frequency, so a certain free space wavelength, uh, and therefore this physically cannot happen. We can't get this diffracted field because it doesn't have wavelength lambda. It would not correspond to that. So that the Bragg condition then can be thought of as this so-called wave vector diagram picture here. that we will only get a diffracted field if when we take the incident wave vector and add the grading vector we end up with a point that is on the sphere of radius 1 over lambda and then that defines a valid refracted wave vector that's the bragg condition and that is what distinguishes a volume hologram from a planar hologram for a planar hologram for for any uh grading vector on a planar surface, any incident plane wave will produce a diffracted field. But for a volume grading vector, only certain incident fields will produce a diffracted field, ones that lead to a Bragg matched condition. And this is the key to applications of volume holograms. Um, let's look at this Bragg matching condition in a little more detail. And for illustrative purposes, let's first assume we go back to the case where we have really two dimensional fields. We're assuming there's no variation in the y coordinate. So therefore, vi and vg would be equal to zero. All right, this will be the 2D case. And then we plot out now, instead of a sphere, we would have a circle. And imagine now, we have a particular grading vector. UG. Well, we know that that would brag match this incident field to this diffracted field. Now take that grading vector and move it, its base, along this 
circle. So if we moved it over here, what would it would look something like that. Well, because the now the tip doesn't fall in the circle, that won't brag match any incident field to a diffracted field. Keep moving it around. We eventually would get over here. Uh, I didn't draw that very well. And there would be another place over here where that same grading vector would have its both its base and its tip on that circle. So it would now take this incident field and brag match it to that diffracted plane wave. So for the 2D case, a certain uh, grading vector can brag match two different incident fields. Now let's think about the 3D case. U, W, and V. Now this is a sphere. Remember this, and this has a radius of one over lambda. This is now a sphere of that same radius. And now we have here a grading vector. And we know that on the other side of this circle here, could get that same grading vector. But now this is a sphere, so that means that we actually can rotate this thing around a cylinder. And it will always keep both its base and its tip on the sphere. So we get actually now a set of uh, different input and incident and diffracted vectors oops that fall on a cylinder and so there's a whole family now of if we go back here these uh, we get grading vectors that would look like this and they would just go around that cylinder like so. So that's the same grading vector, just moved around that cylinder and it would brag match a set of incident and diffracted wave vectors, which would then just could be rotated around that, that cylinder. So this is important that um, we have that a single vector brag matches a set of incident wave vectors to the corresponding diffracted wave vectors. So that's a subtlety in this process. And in detailed applications of volume holography, you gotta be careful about that because <clears throat> if you're assuming that a particular grading vector is gonna be used to brag match a particular incident wave vector to a particular diffracted wave vector, well, it, it will also match a different incident wave vector to a different diffracted wave vector. Okay, so you gotta be, gotta be careful about that. So with that said, now we get down to the question of how do we get one of these volume gratings? And this now gets us into the realm of volume holography. Just as recording the hologram, the planar hologram of a plane wave led to a planar diffraction grating. So recording a volume hologram of a plane wave will lead to a volume diffraction grating. 
So imagine we have what we'll call an object field g sub o of vector position x. And any function of space that corresponds to an optical field at some particular wavelength lambda can be represented as a superposition of plane waves. So we've seen this in our study of diffraction. So let's assume we have n plane waves. So some little n is equal to 1 to big N, amplitude a n, e to the i, 2 pi, un dot x. And because each of these are a plane wave at wavelength lambda, we must have that the norm or length of wave vector un is equal to 1 over lambda. And that's for all for all n. And let's have a reference beam, just as we did in planar holography. R of x is e to the i 2 pi u incident wave vector dot vector position x. And of course, that's also a plane wave with wavelength lambda. So you are, sorry. Uh, yeah, not, not u sub i. Let's make that u sub r. Magnitude u sub r must also be 1 over lambda. So what is, throughout space, the intensity of the sum of these two fields? Okay, so we'll have i at vector position x, which will be the magnitude of the object field, plus the reference wave, magnitude squared of that. So that would be, well, that would be g object plus the reference wave times the conjugate. g object conjugate plus reference conjugate. And what will that be? Uh, that will be, well, let's see, we'll have r times r conjugate. That's the magnitude of r squared, which is just 1. And then g o times g o conjugate, that's the magnitude of, well, let's just write it like this, g, magnitude g o of x squared. And then the cross terms. So we'll have, let's see here, we'll have r times g object conjugate. So, well, that's just going to be the conjugate of this expression, and then times r, so that's just going to add in uh, 2 pi ur dot x into this exponent. So we're going to get then, that's going to be the sum, sorry, that's plus, sum n equals 1 to big N a n conjugate, because in general this could be complex, representing a, a phase shift, e to the minus i 2 pi un, so that's from the conjugation, we get a minus sign, and then we're going to have r here, so that's going to be e to the plus i 2 pi ur, so that'll be minus minus ur dot x, right? So minus minus ur gives e to the i 2 pi ur dot x. So that comes from r times g object conjugate, and then we've got our conjugate times g object, which is just the conjugate of this. So that'll just be simply the sum little n equals 1 to big N, a n e to the plus i, 2 pi u n minus u r dot x. Now, if we have a medium that can record this intensity distribution, we see what happens. We would generate grading vectors, let's call it UGN, which would be the difference of the nth wave vector in the object field and the wave vector of the reference beam. And so we would generate then a whole bunch of those gradings, n of those, in fact, one for each one of the wave vectors in the object field.
And then if we could form a 3G transmittance, T of vector x, which is proportional to, we'll just say equal to this, this intensity distribution, then we would be able to record these volume diffraction gratings. In fact, a, a collection of volume diffraction gratings, and we would call that a volume hologram. So the process of recording a, uh, a volume transmittance function is, is, has some subtle physics and things that you'd have to look into. Just We're going to gloss over most of that. I would just say that it's possible to get this effect if you have a thick uh, photographic emulsion. So thick emulsions can give you this. And there are also certain crystals, particularly so-called photo... refractive uh, crystals that have uh, uh, undergo changes with respect uh, in response to the intensity distributed throughout space and they can be kind of fixed in similar to the way that we fix a photographic film by developing it and they can be multiply exposed and other things very similar to what you can do with photographic film uh, and then in many cases, they can be erased with, by illuminating with ultraviolet light. So we have media that can basically do this uh, recording of a 3D transmittance function uh, in response to a uh, three-dimensional distribution of intensity that's created by taking an object field and adding in a reference beam and then using the intensity of that to generate this 3D transmission uh, transmittance function. And that would, we would call a volume hologram. So now, suppose um, we take our original reference beam, e to the i2 pi vector ur dot vector x, and use it to illuminate this volume transmittance function. So just naively writing out this product, we would get now well, this reference beam, e to the i2 pi ur dot x times the first two terms in our intensity function were one for the magnitude squared of the reference beam plus the magnitude squared of the object field. Now, we're going to neglect that because it would be proportional to the square of the amplitudes of those different plane waves. We'll assume that that's small. So we assume that the object field is much smaller in amplitude than the reference beam. And if that's true, then the object field squared is negligible. So we'll neglect that. So that just it gives you then just the original reference beam. And then we've got plus, so the two complex terms, n equals 1 to big N, a n conjugate, e to the minus i, 2 pi. We had un minus ur, and of course, minus, so we had this, un minus ur. Of course, minus minus would be plus, but now we have another factor with ur. So this would give us now 2 ur, so it would become minus minus 2ur, so it would look like this, un minus 2ur dot x, and then the conjugate term would be the sum n equals 1 to big N, a n, e to the i 2 pi, we had un minus ur, but now we got times the ur term. So we got plus ur minus ur cancels out, just leaves un dot x. Of course, that is just your object field. So we've reconstructed the object field. We also have the reference beam. Neglect this term. And now, what about this term here? Well, probably, we'll assume this is the case, 
un minus 2 ur will not be equal to 1 over lambda. Right, this has a 2 ur has a length of 2 over lambda. So it would be very unlikely that this would be Bragg match. So we'll assume, and of course in actual applications you'd have to check very carefully to make sure this was the case that you, we're going to assume but you have to check to make sure this is not Bragg matched. None of those terms are. And if that's the case, then that thing does not produce any diffracted field. So what we end up with then is just our original reference beam and our object field. So this is how you would read out a volume hologram. Now, that's really no different than the result, of course, that you would get with a planar hologram. We know that if we illuminate, well, we record a planar hologram with some reference beam, and then we read out that hologram with the same reference beam, we reconstruct the original object field. But now here's the subtlety that comes about because of Bragg matching. Um, let's ask, what if we did the same process, but we were to illuminate with a different reference beam. Let's call it e to the i 2 pi us dot x, right? And where us is not equal to ur. In other words, we're going to illuminate this with a different plane wave from the reference beam that we use to record the volume hologram. What happens then? So, if we took e to the i 2 pi us dot x times the transmittance function, we would get e to the i 2 pi us dot x times 1 plus the magnitude of the object field squared. And again, neglect that because it'll be very small and then we get sum n equals 1 to begin a n conjugate e to the minus i 2 pi u n and we had then minus u r from recording of the hologram and now we'll have times uh, this us term so minus minus will be plus so again we'll have minus minus us dot x whereas before we had minus ur minus ur was minus 2 ur and then we've got the conjugate term that looks like n equals 1 to begin a n e to the plus i 2 pi un minus ur, uh, now times a plus us term, so plus us dot x, and when us and ur are the same, these would cancel out, and that's where we would recover the original object field. But now, um, if we assume that generally un minus ur minus or plus another ur, does not give us a magnitude of 1 over lambda, these will not be Bragg matched. So both of these produce no diffracted field, and what you'll end up with then is simply the incident field. In other words, the transmittance function will look completely transparent if we illuminate it with a plane wave that is not the original reference plane wave we use to record that volume hologram. So the volume hologram then only reads out 
when illuminated by the original reference beam used to record it. And we could call this Bragg selectivity. Uh, the volume hologram is very selective. It only responds and reads out if it's illuminated by the original reference beam used to record it. You use a different reference beam, different plane wave, and it doesn't read out anything. Well, that now starts to sound a little bit like a memory device. In other words, we could record some particular object field with a particular reference beam, and then we could recall that object field by illuminating the volume hologram by that reference beam. And then we could imagine doing a double exposure and recording a different object field with a different reference beam. And now we could recall either of those different object fields by illuminating it with one or the other of the reference beams. And we could extend this to any number of object fields and reference beams. So this is the basis of holographic data storage. So let's imagine here in the XY plane, we've got transmittance function and um, it, let's suppose it consists of a number of pixels and the black ones will be off pixels and let's say the red ones here will be on pixels That'll be on, and these will be off. And then we put, place that in the front focal plane of a lens. Now what's gonna happen? Well, let's, uh, let's treat these little pixels as small enough to be considered as point sources. They produce a spherical wave, and if that's in the front focal plane, then this lens will collimate those spherical waves into plane waves. So if we take a particular single one of these guys here, this then will collimate out into a plane wave. Now imagine out here we have, say, a photorefractive crystal or other volume recording medium. And we also illuminate that with a plane wave reference beam. And let's call this set of pixels a data set D sub i. So we take a set of on off pixels, right? So think of these as bits. Each one of those bits creates a plane wave. And so the sum of all those plane waves is an object field over here. Right? So we can think of this as your this is your G object of X. And then we illuminate also that uh, volume recording device, not only with the object field, but a corresponding reference beam. And then that'll record a volume hologram. So this is the record phase of writing data into this volume hologram. And then we have a recall phase, and we can do this with multiple data sets by doing multiple exposures of the volume hologram. And then to do recall, and this would be here the z-axis, or recall, then we take this volume and we illuminate it with one of those reference beams, R sub i. That's going to now create all of the plane waves that were corresponded to that original data set di and then putting that um, into a lens a focal length f will then convert those plane waves into converging spherical waves and so they will converge down after a focal length f to a point in an output plane 
And so what we will get then uh, is we will reconstruct this original data set. Subtle issue is that right, this is a, um, a Fourier transform and then you would really want to do an inverse Fourier transform to recover this data set. Instead, you do another Fourier transform, but that's like a inverse transform with 180 degree rotation of the data. So you actually get, we'll call it DI bar. It's just a rotated version of this. So you'd get to say these off pixels up here, which would be these two down there. Uh, you'd get this guy in the center, this over here, and then you get some on pixels. The other pixels would be on. And all you'd have to do to read those out is just have your, your uh, sensing, your image sensing device uh, just rotated 180 degrees. Okay, so that's the recall phase. So if DI and RI are the ith data set and reference beam, then we can just continue to do that for more and more values of i, more data sets and more reference beams. And the potential storage number of bits that could be stored by this method, uh, you can show it varies as the volume of the cube divided by the cube of the wavelength. Uh, basically, um, in the structure of the diffraction gratings, you can't have the correspondence to the, a volume pixel or a voxel can't be smaller than about a wavelength on a side. So you can end up storing on the order of V over lambda cube. So if, if uh, this cube is one centimeter on a side, it's, it's a, it is a cube, uh, and lambda is half a micron, uh, that's somewhere on the order of uh, several um, terabits of information. Okay, well, you can get a terabyte uh, hard drives, you know, so what's the big deal? Well, a big advantage of this is this system has no moving parts and it's massively parallel. Instead of reading one bit at a time or one byte at a time and reading that out, you could imagine this uh, was some spatial light modulator, like you could use like an LCD type of screen, uh, or you could have some reflective version of that. But let's say you had a thousand by a thousand pixel array, so that'd be one million bits that you re could record in one go with one reference beam. And when you read it out, you get those one million bits all in parallel. So very rapid writing and readout. Um, and so you can record and recall all of these different data sets just by having different reference beams. So this is holographic data storage. And uh, in the PDF notes, there's a link to a Microsoft project, which is attempting to use this kind of technology for um, massively parallel um, short-term storage for uh, web computing applications.